Support for life's learning curve comes from Six Toad Cinema, currently videos more prevalent everywhere than any other time. If you're considering video advertising, education-based learning video, corporate work, or anything in between, find Six Toad Cinema at sixtoadcinema.vistaprintdigital.com. Making film, making change. Six Toad Cinema. When I was 12, I began junior high school. And on that first day of school, with all the calm and savvy any 12-year-old boy might muster, we all awkwardly and apprehensively merged three separate cities into one school community. Now, I met a friend that day. He would show many of us how to stand up for ourselves and how to speak up when necessary. He influenced a school community and then later, a family. Well, now here it is many years later, and we're many years older. So today, here at Studio 502 in the mid-mid-mid-midwest, my friend Joe Palladino is with us to share just where that confidence came from and how he achieved that in that awkward age. And that strong voice that blazed a trail for so many with gratitude and confidence. This is Life's Learning Curve. And I'm Paul Hart. Stand by. Please indulge me as I bring in a friend of the show. Often some of our best podcasts we've shot and recorded because of a common story framework. And I believe that's what you're going to find on today's show. Our podcast has the following four segments. Segment one. Joe makes teachers agitated. Here, Joe finds his voice can be a tool for fun, profit, and school shenanigans. In segment two, Joe sees crowds react the DJ years. Joe finds himself struggling in between late night DJing and becoming a sports announcer. And just what motivated him to choose one over the other? In segment three, Joe's family. Here Joe continues use of his most effective God-given gift, his voice, but in new ways. Segment four, how Joe's junior high school experience became an extended family. Let's meet Joe Paladin. Today we're here at Studio 502 and we have Mr. Joe Palladino. And I do know Joe. For me, he's a lifelong friend from football and junior high school and high school and parties and things like that. But these days for Joe and me, it's reunions. <laughs> we see each other and Facebook probably. But we're still here. And uh, one of the things, if you think about Joe, you think of this personality, the big personality and the, the voice that cut through and garnered a lot of attention in middle school. And it could be a full hallway, but all the way down the end of the hallway, there's that voice. <laughs> so Joe, where did that voice and that confidence come from? From the time I was in first and second grade, my report cards always came home with, Joe is very disruptive in class. Uh -huh. Joe is, I always like to talk. Uh -huh. And it's funny thing is I have two quiet parents. I don't oh. know where I got my personality. I mean, obviously yeah. my dad's personality would come out when he was with his relatives, but right. um, I just, I, I just always like talking and singing, and I guess you could say I was like a class clown. I never thought that I had like a classic voice, but uh, people have told me over the years, and I'm very loud. I work in customer service, <laughs> and, <laughs> and when I think I'm whispering, I'm actually yeah. like Joe. Could you quiet down? But I've had this kind of baritone voice, and yeah. and people always wanted to tell me to go in to be go be a DJ go be an announcer was there a time you felt your voice was maybe too loud and got you in trouble I got me in trouble a lot yeah and it got me in trouble a because I couldn't stop talking and didn't know when to end conversations and uh -huh. um yes because I was a loud person I was always the person that was heard and we could be in the back of the class sometimes or I could be I could be whispering to someone thinking I'm whispering. <laughs> yeah. And it'd be like, Mr. Paladino? Yeah. 
And uh, do you, you know, have something you'd like to say to the rest of the class? Exactly. Yes. And uh. even I remember a, a story from second grade. <laughs> I I was never afraid to get in trouble, so I caused other people to get in trouble. And I remember we had a teacher at Laurel Hill named Mrs. Vent. Okay. And uh, now this is, you got to remember this is in the '60s for everybody. So. Right. And uh, everything was one in black day, and white. I decided that when they ended recess, I told two friends, let's not go back. Yeah. Let's not go back to school. Right. Let's stay out here and play on the tether balls and everything. I talked two guys into it. Uh-huh. I don't know why. They oh, we're with you, Joe. We're with you. Uh-huh. So she yelled for us to come in. And finally, after about five or ten minutes, she went in and brought the principal out. Finally, we went back into class. And she brought the three of us in front of class. She sat down on a chair. And uh-huh. she put me over her knee yeah. with a huge paddle and paddled my butt four or five times and the other two guys that were with me and the class was like horrified and i kind of had a smirk on my face which was not good Uh uh-huh but when i obviously like you know how it is you have a military dad i went home dad teacher paddled me Uh uh-huh well what did you do i didn't come in from recess well then you deserved deserved it. it Yeah, yeah, and that's how people were then. But that's right. I knew then I could like influence people, you know, uh-huh. and, and uh, I would always get people in trouble. I get myself in trouble. But were there times ever you found yourself like uh, directing people to do things, and you kind of stood back and watched as they did things? Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of times, especially in our neighborhood. We grew, you know, what we grew up in a neighborhood where yeah. there was maybe twenty kids all around one or two years the same age. Yeah. And I had guys that I looked up to in our neighborhood. And then That's when they sitcom, moved on. That's a Jill. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And I learned from them. And then yeah. I just carried on, you know. And yeah. it was like, okay, Joe, we're moving on. It's time for you to be the the big cheese in the neighborhood yeah. to organize all right. the games and, and everything. Yeah. One of my first influences, besides my parents, right? Uh, my neighbor across the street, JP, we called him. Uh-huh. JP was four years older than us. He was an athlete, a star yeah. athlete. I learned a lot of stuff from JP. He influenced a lot of my musical tastes and everything. Uh-huh. And one of the saddest days of my life, JP was one of the best pitchers on the Elgin High team. We were all running across the street one day, and JP was chasing us. And it was at night, and he didn't see a car coming. Nailed it. Tore his knee apart. And he wasn't ever, ever able to play baseball again. Really? It was going into his senior year. We all felt bad. He was never the same. I mean, he came back, but he couldn't pitch. He was like the leader of our block. You know, it was oh, JP. Boy. He organized all of us. And uh, when he went on to college, then we were the older kids. My mouth protected me. I didn't get in a lot of fights because... I guess I learned how to talk tough. You know, okay, this guy wants to kick my Mm -hmm. But I would just say, hey, what's your problem? Mm -hmm. You know, I talked my way out of a lot of fights in my day. Yeah. And that's one of the things that helped me. I could always, you don't want to hit me. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. And I learned that being too, working in bars and being a bouncer and, you know, you get some weird people. That's a life skill, too, because you'll come up against people, well, especially intoxicated people. They think they're bulletproof. Yep. And uh, so there's the psychology on that. But if you also have the voice to back it up, um, sometimes it's just physical size. you got to talk tough, yeah. But you have to talk tough, and it does help the situation, too. And I would use my dad... um, I never seen my dad get in any fights or anything. But my dad always had this cool Mm -hmm. calm to him. And when if there was like arguments in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. or my dad always knew how to calm the situation just by talking. You know, my dad was very similar to that. Boy, as a as a boy, you learn a lot from that, don't you? Yeah, you, you do. carry that with you the rest of your life. And my dad was uh, um, <clears throat> at a go kart, and my friends would come over. We'd do the go kart in the alley, and it was fun. And and yeah, if a car came, we pulled over, and we made sure we were not in the way. But there was a guy that lived down the street. And he just hated us being back there. It was just he thought it was kids just you know raising you know heck with with the neighborhood. But we weren't. You know, we were stopped. We stopped, and we were polite. And uh, he called the police on us, not once, but met multiple times. And I'd never had any problems with the police up till, God. this is about seventh grade. And uh, uh, my dad said, well, let's go down and talk to him. 
he walks down the aisle and he turns around and after a while he walked back and I said, uh, well, what'd you say to him, Dad? And he said, well, he said, uh, if you keep calling the police on these kids, they're going to be like uh, not shooting your windows out. They're going to be doing things exactly. that are far worse than that. You don't want that and I don't want that either. Yeah. I said, how did you know to say that? And he said, because I used to be one of those kids that would knock out windows. <laughs> exactly. A lot of people could learn lessons from our parents' generation. Yeah, right. They were different, but, uh, you know, uh -huh. we, you and I grew up in a time that, that no longer exists. Talk about guys that love music and love being DJs. Mm -hmm. I know you probably had a close friend like that, but Ken and I... From the time we were 12 years old and we started buying singles at Zayer. Yep. We would have uh, turntables in our basement. Yep. And we'd set up cassette tape player recording oh, on microphones. Really? And we would do, we had a, a, a fake, I know this sounds geeky, and we did this until we oh. got out of high school. We had a radio station called WKEN. 83 a.m. WKEN. Mm -hmm. And Hanover Park was the rock and roll capital of the world. We had the Hanover Park Rock Arena. Nice. And uh, we would do tapes for our friends. We would be like, this is before I even got into radio class. We learned how to splice together promos. Mm -hmm. And we even had one of those things where um, you could attach it to your phone and record the phone call. Really? And we'd have Which our friends Which was really novel in. for back then. Exactly. We'd have yeah. our friends call in and would go through the tape recorder and they would act like oh. they were, hey, we want to hear uh, Freebird by oh. Leonard Skinner. Uh -huh. Or uh, you're, just, you're the 12th. Caller, you just won two tickets. <laughs> ben and I did this from the time we were 12 until literally we were out of high school. That, I still, no, when no, I'm no. in the car yeah. and I'm playing my mixtapes, yeah. my my shuffle, I'll, I'll just bust into, uh -huh. hey, that's Whisper to a Scream, yep. Icicle Works, 1980s. and Yeah. You know, I, hit, hitting the post, right? So, yeah. <laughs> you, you keep talking to you, hit the post. <laughs> I was in on the early inception of cassette recorders. My dad brought one home, and so I would. I was obsessed with like visual media. I mean, I really liked, and I, I used to write stories. I used to uh, draw pictures to go along with them. But but, and I was motivated by both things. And I would hold a microphone up to the TV because I was very interested in certain shows. I would record the shows, just the audio, because there wasn't videotape back then, yep. at least for us at the consumer level and uh, I would record probably the beginnings of shows like how they went from the very the intros through the theme music and then for some reason I, I, I would watch the show but it wasn't interested past then mm -hmm. now since then I've come across like four or five people in my life who did the exact same thing yeah don't you think it was more creative the way you were doing it oh yeah I mean we, we worked all night to do it we used to split cassette yeah. tape oh did you and spin it back and um Ben's Ben's used to make we used to make eight millimeter movies the six million dollar man we'd film us jumping off the roof and yeah. then we'd run it backwards like we were jumping onto the roof uh -huh. from the ground Rust was another one of our friends would yeah. we'd have a scene where he's chasing down the car and he'd run in front of the car and stop it and we would show the speedometer going 55 miles per hour nice you know just with cuts and stuff yeah but it was fun that we had to think about that yeah and it's shot for yeah. shot stuff yes and now you yeah. just go on the phone and I yeah. can make a movie yeah. in 10 minutes or a lot of things on our, uh, are templated where you can just drop in things you drop in this yep. this this and it makes the movie but that's for you you learned your creativity back then it made me feel good i mean it I, is and also i have to say i had very supportive parents who put up with this our parents never stifled our creativity no my parents they must have hated the music i was playing down there and they could hear me mixing it going from one song to the other and saying, mm -hmm. Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, now off the request lines, out to Schomburg. Nice. Here yeah. is some Love Hurts by Nazareth. And I cut it right. And my parents was like, what, what are you doing down there, John? I'm just making tapes. Yeah. Recording tapes. And um, it, it was hard when you had girlfriends and they're like, you're listening to yourself on a cassette tape. Uh-huh. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Answer. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Just why don't we just listen to the radio? Because I like the music I'm playing. Because this is me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd get them involved. Why don't you uh, yeah. pretend you're calling the show and make a request? Exactly. You're a geek. Yeah, I know. I, I want you to do that. Uh, 
Uh, Did you with, want to be a teacher? No. I mean, now you end oh, up no. being a teacher. And yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it was the last thing I wanted to be. The story goes, and it's a short story, but when I got to um, college, the, my four, third year of college, I had to commit to a major, and I had taken every general class I could because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I first wanted to go for journalism, uh, but... I had found out or had been told by way too many people that was a dying uh, industry yep. and you shouldn't go into it. It was a hot day in August and the the uh, student center didn't have air conditioning and the sun was beating down on me. This this is going to sound crazy, but it's a true story. I went to the shortest line. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I became a teacher. <laughs> and I got through that line. There was only, I think, uh, two people ahead of me in line. The rest had like 15 to 20 people. We got in there, got out of there, and I had a, uh, that's, I had a career with that. I always wanted to be in radio and broadcasting. Right. And when I got out of high school, um, I took two years at Elgin. I found, well, I always found this too structured. Yeah. After being in my basement from the time I was 12, oh, yeah. I, I couldn't handle the reading the structured PSAs. You know, you're listening to WEPS and uh -huh. all that. Uh -huh. And I did get a chance, though. I remember one of for extra credit. Yeah. Um, we could uh, do uh, two. We come in and do two hours of a radio show um, that they would broadcast after hours at like 10 yeah. o'clock at night after football I'd listen games. to that. Yeah. It was almost like freeform radio back then for uh -huh. us. I always found it too structured. And back then... You had to get an FCC license. Yes, that's right. To be an on, you had to be able to repair the tower to be an <laughs> on-air personality. And I never, I could never pass my FCC license. Yeah. So I decided then, when I got out of high school, I went right to the Midwestern Broadcasting School in Chicago, and I completed my courses there. And I had a nice job working in, I uh, was just working at a company called Nuclear Data. Gotcha. Had a good job working in uh, production, and. When I graduated from the Midwestern... I picture you in a hazmat suit, nuclear data. Well, that's the problem. I didn't have the hazmat suit on. <laughs> when I graduated from them, they were going to place me at a radio station in Beloit, Wisconsin. Okay. A little 2,000-watt station. Right. It's a start. And, but but I know. here I am. I know. I'm, hey, I'm Joe Palladino. I, right. By that time, I had worked in bars. I started out in discos. Mm -hmm. And I figured, oh, yeah. you know what? I'm not. I'm not gonna go to Beloit with maybe no chance of ever coming back to Chicago. Yeah, I had a good daytime job. I was working the clubs at night. Yep. And I always felt that playing music in a club, you got to see the people's reactions to the songs you were making. Playing. Yeah. And I just felt more comfortable talking to the crowd. I was always torn about, did I want to be a late night DJ mm -hmm. or did I want to do play by play? And then when my kids were born, I found the perfect spoil, youth f sports. Mm -hmm. They, I always pitched the idea, well, you know what? We need an announcer. Yeah. yeah. We need to announce the kids, play some right. music, announce them, get excited. And yeah. they were like, well, Mr. Ponyo, do you want to do that? I'm like, darn right. You get me yeah. a system. You get me some speakers. I used to climb up on an eight-foot scaffold, and I'd sit there from the very first game at eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, really? Till the last game at four o'clock in the afternoon. Wow, that's and a passion. And my passion. kids would be playing, and I'd get, I'd be like, uh, when the visiting teams would come, can I get one of your rosters? I wanted to make sure I was yeah. doing professionally. Sure. And uh, but I loved it from the time my kids started football at five and six, or baseball too. I would do the all-star games. Yeah. You know what, Paul? One of the most exciting things for me because I was never, I never got to live that life is. The Bartlett girls went to the state championships. Okay. I got to broadcast at Illinois State University, oh. right at center court, uh -huh. with a screen that gave me instant stats <laughs> and replays. <laughs> and I was like amazed. I'm like, look at this. It's a, <laughs> I can even tell you how many points we got off of steals. <laughs> it was the first time I felt like I was doing a Could professional you, broadcast. You must have, like, it must have been a huge moment because... You were in your basement when you were a kid yep. doing radio, uh, music, and then you were climbing a pole. Do that was it Little League baseball or what? Yep. Was it? Yeah, and now you're at U of I. When we play baseball in the neighborhood, I do the play-by-play. -play. <laughs> Billy Williams up the bat. <laughs> Williams is two for three today, yeah. and we do that through the, the whole neighborhood. But I never got to be a professional doing those Bartlett games for all those years. Yeah, 
was probably the high, first of all, I got to announce my kids. And, and, and so, having the parents tell me, you know, Joe, we turned down the TV broadcast yeah. and listened to the WEPS broadcast. I'm like, that's what you do. That's all I need to know. What would be a dream job for you? Like today, if tomorrow, if you could like make it happen. To be the, the public address announcer at Wrigley Field. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the friendly confines. Uh -huh. Here's the starting lineup for your Chicago Cubs. Uh -huh. I mean, I would, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I would yeah. love to do that. You know what? I sent tapes in. When I was 12 years old, I didn't think I was going to be in the restaurant industry for 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I do for yeah. a living. Yeah. Um, I always thought I was going to be in something where I got to use my mouth and my personality. And yeah. I do. I, yeah. mean, I deal with customers every day. Yeah. And uh, sometimes my mouth still gets me in trouble at work when I'm not happy with a customer. It's not a compromise. Don't be offended. You started doing DJing, right? Yep. And uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about that. I took a, a job at the Peppermint Stick Lounge, uh -huh. and I, I actually liked it. Yeah, you know, I I I was never one of those mix DJs, mm -hmm. but I could you know cut the songs pretty good. Yeah, and from there they started a disco at the Hoffman Lanes, mm -hmm. and I was enjoying it. It was good good after work cash. Plus it was fun, and you're meeting people. And right? then the whole disco craze came, and right. I jumped all over that. Mm -hmm. And I got hired at a bar in, in uh, Carroll Stream called Galen North Rock Club. Okay. Just about a week before they were going to switch to rock. They wanted me to do the whole Steve Dahl thing. The transition. So we're going right. to do a night when you're going to take the disco records and you're going to just start flying them across the bar. Uh -huh. And then you're just going to start spinning rock records. Okay. And the band, first band to play that night, Jim Peterick and Survivor. We made the transition, and I was, at, at the time, I was with my current girlfriend, Cindy. Yeah. I was dating her at that time. Beautiful. It was fun. I, I got to work with, I mean, you were around back then. Mm -hmm. The Chicago band bar scene mm -hmm. between like 1978 and 1981, there was at least 20 bands that had recording concerts. There was Survivor. Mm -hmm. There was Off-Broadway. There was The Kind. There was uh, The Boys from Illinois. Mm -hmm. All great bands to work with. So I got my niche working in bars where I played before the bands, yep. during their breaks, yep. and then after the bands. And I got to meet so many people. After they closed, I went to, to me, it was the, the best bar I ever worked at. It was called Studio One in Downers Grove. Okay. Steve Dahl played there. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Brandmeier, again, mm -hmm. Sur Survivor was our house band. And I, w I remember getting the demos for Eye of the Tiger to play at the bar. <laughs> used to be a record store in Hanover Park. Guy would give me demo records. Yeah. I'd go in there and I'd buy records. He goes, hey, listen, CBS just dropped off this, this record. It stinks. He goes, you might want to listen to it. It's a bunch of girls from California, the Go-Go's or something. <laughs> so I bring it to the bar that night, and I always used to like to play for when the girls, the waitresses yeah. and everybody were setting up. I said, hey, listen, I'm going to play some music from this album. You girls tell me what you think of it. Mm -hmm. So I played We Got the Beat. Yep. I just picked a song randomly. Yeah. And they're like, that's really good. And they go, you should play that tonight. So I started it in my rotation every night. I'd play, hey, this music. is a new band out of California called the Go-Go's. Yeah. And funny, about six months later, they started playing the Go-Go's on the radio in Chicago. So you were ahead of them. And I'm like, we were playing them in Studio One. Right. And the guy, I remember Jim Peterick coming up to me. And it's funny because Jim really? Peterick worked, his father uh -huh. worked with my father at Automatic Electric really? in Northlake. That's because ironic. I remember my dad coming home in the 60s and saying, Joey, you ever heard of a song called Vehicle, The yeah. Eyes of March? I go, oh, dad, yeah. they're awesome. He goes, yeah. oh, I work with the singer's father. Like, really? really? I want to meet yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I always was able to be on the fringe. Yeah. I never quite got that break. Uh-huh. And it, once I got married... It's the biz, man. I, I stopped yeah. working as a DJ. Yeah. Two thousand and seven, my friend Steve owned a bar and asked me to come and work on Thursday nights, and that's how I re met Cindy. 
She came is into there, the bar. Uh, Steve would put my name up there. Come and see DJ Joe Paladino and Cindy that's came That's divine in. intervention, man. That yep. is that it was meant to be. And she was that was meant know, to be. And it was I'm, nice to reconnect with her. And I've been with her oh, for twelve years. And, isn't uh, that cool? I still like. I, I love DJ, and I. I I'm still the geeky guy at the New Year's Eve party that puts together the five mixtapes. All during the, the 1980s, I would do the top 100 songs of the year, and we'd put in the tapes, and when 100 through 80 was done, I'd pull it out and put the next one in. I was always that guy. Yeah. When my kids were growing up, my ex-wife was the smart one. She handled all the education. So what I used to do then is I would volunteer for the fun fairs. Yeah. Well, what can you do, Mr. Paladino? Well, I go, well... Who announces the winners of the raffles? Mm -hmm. Well, no one. I'd get on the microphone. Yeah, that's right. Here's the winners of our the Hart family, the yeah. Paladino family. And my kids, they'd come into the office with me. And they'd be like, just, that's my dad. That's uh -huh. my dad announcing all of our names. <laughs> and then I would do the fun fairs. I yeah. would be tug of war. Yeah. And I'd get the kids going, okay, girls on this side, guys on this side, girls, are you ready? Yeah. Guys, are, are you, you ready? ready? And I'd make it fun. And so yeah. every year, yeah. the kids would come home and say, Dad, uh, the, the gym teacher wants to know if you're going to take off of work and work field day. I would do field yeah. day, too. What you brought to the table, you know, was significant. You know, yeah. you, you brought you. Just, I, I, so. I just didn't want to embarrass my kids. Yeah. That's, I always use that to, yeah. to fit in. You know, my, my granddaughter, Maddie, started T-ball this year. Uh-huh. And I went to the games, and I'm a... Flashing back, yeah. I, I'm a coach. Yeah, I know. I will always be a coach. Right. And uh, the first day I went, I tried to sit back. Grandpa. <laughs> yeah. Baseball. Right. right. And I told, I told my son, Chris, Chris, we got to work with her. And first of all, you got to go help these coaches. Because Chris was a great baseball player. Yeah, yeah. So the second game, Maddie get a little bit better. Chris went out and coached third base. I went and sat in the dugout and organized the kids. Because oh, there's only good. two coaches on the team. Yeah, yeah. And my daughter-in-law was like, Grandpa. Grandpa's in the I'm dugout. I'm like, I'm just going to get the kids. Okay, you're up next. Here's your helmet. Here's your bat. Right. Sit. Sit. Next one. Good. I did that for the rest of the season. Yep. And Maddie got better as year yeah. went on. I, I don't think I could coach in this day and age because it's all too politically correct. No. My day has come. You ask, well, that's even my sons say they can't coach. Really? Because they're used to the way I coach them. Right, right. And Matt's, my son, Matt, he goes, Dad, I won't be able to coach. I would right. be, I'd be having those kids doing push ups and sit ups and yelling at them like you used to do to us. Right. But it, it, it's a different, yeah. it's a different world now. Yeah. What do you think your purpose is right now? I know what it would like to be. First of all, I'd like to be retired. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the questions you you ask is if you could go back to 12-year-old Joe. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would have told 12-year-old Joe, follow your dreams. Yeah. Do what you like. And then I would have told 25-year-old Joe, put money away because someday mm -hmm. all your friends are going to be 58 and 60 years old and they're all going to retire and you're going to have to work until you're 65 or 66. Yeah. That's the one thing. I want to be able to spend more time with my grandchildren. Right. And um, See, on Facebook, it looks like... See, that's the great thing about Facebook. Yeah. It looks like you're, you're there all the time. I'm not, though. Those yeah. are pictures my daughter takes. I see my grandchildren. I probably don't see them as much as I should see them, and that's my fault. Even with my own children, I didn't feel like I was a father until they became six and seven years old. I was, understand and that. My, and like I said, my ex-wife will say, I wasn't good. With babies, right, and and kids before kindergarten, um, I just now seem to be developing a relationship with my oldest Grand granddaughter, kids, yeah. Maddie. Yeah. She's five, She's and not, that's yeah. when I took over with my kids. Then, mm -hmm. once I could participate in their football and their soccer and their baseball, I felt mm -hmm. more like a father. Mm -hmm. I threw myself into that. A uh, famous story about me changing a diaper and vomiting into a screen. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest, most uh, visual uh, oh. you'll get today. And with me, yeah. it was making their stuffed animals talk, and and they all had personalities, and they all, you know, were were getting into trouble and stuff. And my kids liked that. So I mean, I I found my way. Oh, 
I started teaching about 1980, and there's kids, kids, they're grown ups. Yeah. And they're in their 40s, late 40s. And if I talk to them or communicate with them on Facebook, I, it, it's, I, don't, I, I, don't, I know I'm not talking to a child, but number one, they, they trust that I'm okay uh-huh. and, and they know me. You, we, you spend a lot of time with somebody. Exactly. You get to know somebody. But it's really interesting how after a long period of time you can pick up with people. You can't. Well, look at the high school. Mm-hmm. Look at us. In a, even without Facebook. True. When we'd get together at the reunions, you pick up. And what's nice now is none of us are in any cliques now. Yeah. At the five year reunion, I don't know if you went to the five year reunion. I did go we to We were that still one. in our high school mode. Yeah, I called it a reunion with mustaches. Yes. <laughs> we always turned an era we all had mustaches. Uh, probably now, some of the girls, but yeah. yeah. And now we do reunions, yeah. and it's like we're all just Elgin High School graduates. Yeah. We're not. This group of kids, we're not the jocks, we're not the freaks. Yeah. And it's funny how, and like I said, the younger generation, they don't put a lot of stock in reunions. My kids are like, Dad, if I want to see my friends, I see them on Facebook. Uh huh. I'm like, you guys just don't get it. As they get older, they will appreciate that and maybe miss it. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't live there, it's okay. first time I met Joe would be at our junior high school, which they call middle school now. Yeah. But for us, um, junior high school was uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Okay, And then high school would be the remaining three years. Uh, but it was a unique experience. Now, and it's not just me saying, oh, we had such a special class, or we mm-hmm. had a special this. We really had something unique. They started us off at a brand new school, which had no name. It was called South... Southeast, I East. think it was. Southeast. Southeast. That we was actually just... started at Teft for a half a year, remember? Yeah, exactly. So they didn't have the school even built. And <laughs> they had one class. They started with a seventh grade class. And it wasn't like they took three years. It was a seventh grade class, and it was us, and the school wasn't done. So we went to school um, on split shifts. Yep. And what was it? I'll just throw it to you. Well, we, we went to school at Teft Junior High for split shifts. Yeah. The Streamwood kids that went to Teft yeah. had the morning shift. Uh huh. And they went to school from 6 in the morning six to the ten, noon. Right? Yeah, yeah, till six, like noon or something noon, like tw- that. Till 12, 10. And then yeah. we would start at like 12, 30 uh-huh. and go to like 6, six o'clock at night. Yeah. And that happened. We did that for a half a year. It was kind of cool. One of my cool. first memories, Aaron, that maybe you would uh, remember this too. Yeah. Do you remember we'd always get there early? Yeah, yeah. And we'd play football. Oh, yeah. On the side of yeah. the school. Yeah. We were all just getting to know each other. Right, right. You Throwing the ball around. Clicks. You had the Hanover Park kids, the yeah. Bartlett kids. But I always remember because we'd get there early. Yeah. And we had nothing to do because we couldn't get into school until right. the tough kids cleared we out. We couldn't get in the school. We had to no. wait for everybody to come out. And it would be cold. It would be winter. But again, this is back at a time when it was okay to stand outside at minus 10 degrees or 30 <laughs> degrees. It was okay. We you, made it. So we learned that you had to dress warm and you got to dress warm and period, you have to dress warm. It was cool because they built the school around these peripheral, uh, these, these towns on the perimeter of other uh, middle or junior high schools and they couldn't facilitate them. So South Elgin is a city that's nowhere close to Hanover Park. Mm-hmm. So we had all the kids east and west side, I, yeah, from from South Elgin, mm-hmm. Hanover Park, Bartlett, yep. and I think those were the three big areas. Yep. And now I don't expect everybody to know where these places are on a map, but <laughs> uh, Bartlett is somewhat close to Hanover Park, but South Elgin, no. So you're getting the best of these three cities. Yep. They put us all together and something unexpected and kind of unique happened. I think that's what was unique about it. Well, I only had my Hanover Park friends. Right. A whole new world opened up to us when we it got was. to Eastview. Yeah. yeah. It was like, oh my, where were you from? I'm, I'm from Elgin. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Bartlett. Yeah. You it, And there was like just what, 375 of us, mm-hmm. 400 of us. Right. And every it seemed everybody knew each other. Yeah. We all came from middle class areas of each one of those towns. Mm-hmm. But I remember the first time I went home and I told my dad, I was in seventh grade and I got a Friday night. 
Dad, can you drive me to South Elgin? He's like, what? I'm like, I want to go roller skating. skating. He oh, goes, yeah. roller skating. He goes, where's this? I go, McLean Boulevard. Uh-huh. The old, yeah. most of my best memories of junior high is at roller, roller rinks. rinks. I didn't know how to roller skate. Yeah, and your motivation of getting there was what, what, the girls. girls. Come on now. Come on, it was girls. This, it was the South. Yeah. Nothing against our Hanover Park girls, but no. we met in all the girls from South Elgin. And so they talked about roller skating. So I'm thinking, you know what? If I'm going to meet these girls, <laughs> I have to learn how to I roller, learn skate. How roller skate. Yeah. And I remember dragged my butt around the rink until I finally stood up mm-hmm. and I finally learned to roller skate. Yeah. It took me. Well, that's the way trips. to go, Joe. You had the, like four girls holding you up. Like, uh, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, we were seventh graders, and yeah. you know, this is how this is what your dating was. Yeah. It was that was it. Yeah, yeah. That's true. And, and how was, innocent is that, and how cool is that? I could wish uh, that for. I wish that for any uh, other kid that we age. grew up in an instant time. Yeah, I know. For me, it was all the South Elgin girls. Yeah, I always wondered what they thought about us. Yeah, I would like probably. to sit down. With all of them one time at a reunion. <laughs> that would be a great time. And say, time. you know what? How did you girls feel? We were obviously enamored with all them coming yeah. in in seventh grade. Yeah. And uh, I wonder what they thought of us. Were we just like the... Goofy. The goofy guys. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that Why guy. doesn't know how to roller skate. Um, just the intermingling of all the different... That I, there was a there was a world outside of Hanover Park. Yeah, for me, and you know, we still had our our neighborhood friends, but a whole new world opened exactly. up to us. Exactly, I felt in this. I I I think this was true because of our sports teams as well. Mm-hmm. We were getting the best of South Elgin. We yep. were getting the best of Bartlett. We were getting the very best of exactly of of Hanover Park. And when I say best, I mean it might be sports talent. It might just be. Uh, strong personalities. It might just be into, uh, people who are intelligent or gifted with music or something like that. We're getting the best of all these cities, and when we put all these people together, something happened. Yeah. And we didn't know. We were just kids, man. Yeah. We didn't and know what was going in, down. We were in, and it was a simpler time. I know we all say that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the music was great. I remember. I think it was at the beginning of the eighth grade year. Started bringing a, a record player in. And they're like, Joe, bring in some records. And before oh, school would that's start, right. we would play music. Yeah, that's right. And we'd, we'd blast in, it as loud commons. as we could in the commons before yeah. school started. You did that, huh? Yeah. That we, was you. It was, and Kathy and them, they brought oh. it in. And I brought all the records because yeah. by that time I had a very sizable, because of me and Benj. And they, you put the microphone right down yeah, by the... Yeah, by the microphone there. The and then everybody would just jam to the music yeah. and everything. And uh, It was very laid it, back. We, we also were big card players back then, too. <laughs> so we used to play three card guts. Yeah. We used to pitch quarters we in the back. We played lots Remember of Mr. Cards. Brown would be listening for the quarters? <laughs> He'd come walking in on his chest. What's going up. on? Right, right, right. Hey, what are you guys doing? Are you pitching quarters? <laughs> pitching quarters, <laughs> man. <laughs> pitching quarters. As far as he's concerned, we could have been playing marbles because we were doing all these throwback things that, you know, kids uh, uh, really weren't doing. So it was, it was pretty neat. I, before you were talking about uh, the, the, the skating rinks, uh, uh, and and I heard about it, and I didn't have the strong personality like you did. Uh, so I, I I bought. I couldn't I couldn't skate. So I didn't go to them. But I knew when they were, and every Friday night I'd sit there and go, man, I wish I was there. You got to So finally, finally. I went to one, and this is when it was, um, it was not at the roller rink, but rather at the ice skating rink at the Polar Dome. Oh, okay. And yep. so um, I thought, well, it's it's the same thing. Now, later on, I, I, I snow skied and I cross-country skied. But at this point, no roller skating, no ice skating. <laughs> I tell all my friends, I go, I'm not really a strong skater at all. I don't know. And they go, we'll help you around. So I didn't have the same experience you had with yep. the three pretty girls. You know, I, I had maybe one person saying, you know, go, go, go. Go, you're doing a good job. <laughs> good job. And so I'm on ice, and my ankles are all wobbly, and I'm I'm thinking, you know, I, I've played other sports. I should be able to do this. This should be so. But no, it was a whole different beast. So 
I can remember doing the whole holding on to the <laughs> railing all the way around. And so I'm thinking, this is just no way. I'm not meeting people. And my focus went from being sociable uh-huh. uh, or social at all to just survival. <laughs> I've got to be able to stand up and skate. So somebody, uh, I, I don't remember who came up to me and said, oh, okay, just kind of glide forward with your right foot, push out with your left, with your push out with your right. Oh, so I thought after it became a while, easy. I tried it, and yes, yeah, suddenly I start. I got the glide going. Exactly. Yep. And I started to gather some speed, and I hadn't been taught how to slow down or stop. So I am. It turns into me speed skating around <laughs> the rink, and I, it's me. Just I should might as well have my hands behind my back and bent over because I was just going shh, 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 with the skates, and people are just watching me saying things like, "Wow, he's really fast." Look at Paul go. <laughs> Look, I look at him go, man. But but uh, it was uh, inevitable that it, what would happen from that was uh, you got to stop sometime. And I had no clue how to stop. And either I was going to hit the wall like a car, you know, the Indy 500, and hit the whole wall and crash and burn or break something, or I'd fall. And so I decided, well, let's try and slow it down. And I lost all my balance. And I just remember going, uh, f- sprawled out my stomach, my pants. Uh, face face first into the ice and just slid until I hit the wall and it wasn't a bad crash but what it, what happened was I was sopping wet from my shirt all the way down oh, the no. of my pants. so when I stood up the legs are wobbly again and I just <laughs> wobble over to the exit and thinking this is over man I'm over so but then being Eastview I, I go and sit by the fireplace, and it's nice and warm. And about five other people said, uh, I'm tired of skating. They just sat, and we talked all night and had a really good time. got to be fearless. Can't yeah. worry about it. Well, you yeah. always said, that's yeah. that's all. You know what? I was the one, even starting like in fifth or sixth grade, I was the guy at the dances who was the first guy out there dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Joe. That's something. Joe, go out and dance. Yeah. You go out there, Joe. We'll go out there. Right. Okay, well, I'm gonna look like an idiot. <laughs> but at that time, in my part, my age, I didn't care right. about those kind of things. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I, I that's how I've been my whole life. Yeah. I, I and uh, just go out and do it. You know what? Life is is, is short. And yeah. And you know, it's funny. We sit and we talk about. Um, my kids had reunions already. Like my oldest son had his ten year reunion. Really? Did yeah. not care at all. It seems like today's kids really didn't enjoy school like hmm. we enjoyed school. Um, I mean, I loved my three years mm-hmm. at Eastview. High school was high school. Yeah. Elgin was fun, mm-hmm. but it the three years that I spent at Eastview mm-hmm. were the three years that molded me for my life. Mm-hmm. It introduced me to friends that I might not still be friends with them, but I still have contact with them. Mm-hmm. Whether it be fa- the, the best invention, the only reason I like Facebook, yeah, right, is because it keeps me in touch with you. Absolutely, I got to use my personality on a broader state. Even though you know what, it's funny. I never tried out for plays mm-hmm. and anything. That's the one thing I could never do. Mm-hmm. had nights at Eastview, and again, we're talking about our junior high school a little bit today. Uh, we uh, Nights set aside for drug awareness for our parents. And I don't know I, if you remember I, those, I do. I but do. what happened was they would have, I know we got in science class, we had teachers that would talk about it, at least I did incessantly, about drug use and stuff. And this is around a time where probably 70, 1972, 73, 74, something yep. like that. And, and uh, you know, Drugs were out there. Um, I wasn't in. A, I wasn't uh, connected to any of that. Some people might have been, but I wasn't. I'm sure there were, and I'm <laughs> sure sure there were. And uh, so they really wanted to make the parents uh, understand what's out there. So they had these drug awareness nights, and so 
parents would come and sit in the commons, which is another way of saying a big cafeteria <laughs> with a stage. So they're all in the commons. And sometimes uh, or, uh, we, I always went with, you know. And I'd see what was going on there, and I'd see that uh, they were showing them slideshows, or there was a movie, and it, it was some poorly produced movie <laughs> if that was kid. written by some guy in Hollywood who knew nothing about what was going on. And um, you know, then you go home, and your parents would say, "Are you on something, or are you doing something?" And I'd be like, "No, I'm like in the I'm in my room drawing pictures and writing books and stuff." I'm like, "No, I I don't know." And I'm thinking, maybe I am I supposed to be? Are these things uh, supposed to I be like this? Those, yep. Now, in '79, this is all right, a movie came out, and it's, it was called "Over the Edge" with Matt Damon, and it totally mirrored Matt with Matt, It was his first film. If you don't know anything about it take a look at it but it's just based on this community in Colorado and it was built by uh, this uh, factory or that wanted to facilitate a community for the, their factory and they forgot to put in stuff for kids to do so they didn't do anything else <laughs> except that they were committing crimes they're breaking windows same thing <laughs> It's my neighbor. There, and, and there was drug <laughs> use, and there were things that were going on, and the police get involved. Anyway, it always, and it winds up with a like half the class getting going to jail on a bus, and 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 I'm like, wow, what are we supposed to learn from this? I was so confused by that whole piece. You get my face red. Over the edge with Matt Damon, '79. You talked about. Uh, um, you weren't in plays, and I wasn't in plays either. But I loved. I was. It was the year. I think it was ninth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. I really got into music. Yep. And and I played drums at the time. I grew up uh, playing piano and then played drums. They asked me, "Will you come in on our play and play drums?" And I said, "Yeah." Big Rocket, Candy's, Candy's Mountain. Mountain, Larry Schultz. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah, that yeah. was. See, awesome Joe, you should have had the lead in there. I, I think it was the only play we ever did at right. ECU. Yeah, it was. Big Rocket, Candy's Mountain, and the band was in it. So, so there was a fake band, which I think my friend Dave Grex played fake Dave drums. Grex. And then uh, there was a song. Where we actually did a song live, and I think I played drums. No bass player, nothing else. Don't want to get too elaborate oh, here. Oh my! Uh, we rehearsed at my house a few times. We rehearsed at uh, uh, in South Elgin a few times, and, and finally it was decided. It was between a song called Stagger Lee. And rolling on the river, the Tina Turner version. Yep. So it was decided, not by me, that it would be rolling on the river, the Tina Turner version. And uh, <laughs> so I can remember we come out on stage, and there's like this vamp, the guitar just going ding, 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 ding. And she's supposed to do the Tina Turner song where she talks a little bit in the open, you know. Ba, 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 ba. I'm going to take the beginning of this song. song. <laughs> and we're going to do it slow. But then we're gonna... Anyway, so. I remember Sylvia. So she's got the microphone, which was used to mic your record player, which was just the PA house mic. Yep. And, you know, it looks like a stick. Probably was nothing but trouble. And um, <laughs> and uh, so we're vamping, and I'm playing the drums, and the guitar player's vamping, and she's going, I hear her going, you know, you know, and I can tell it, the, the audio's not coming out in the house. It's oh. not happening. And I looked down at my drums, and the front lug of my drum, she had the microphone cord caught, and one of the XLR connections oh, obviously no. came undone. Nobody had uh, gone over what happens if this doesn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what did happen, and this happened just one out of the two nights we performed, is she goes yanking on this cord, and I believe it disconnected, uh -huh. which uh, I, that's in my mind what it did. But regardless, it, there was not a good signal. And then it turned into one of those dropping the mics and running hysterically off the stage oh, with Paul and me going ding 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 ding. ding, ding. So <laughs> there's the only one thing left to do, and that was just to go one, two, three, four, symbol crash. Live, live stage. Yeah. And then we exited, got out of there. Oh god. So um um those are those are the little things nobody's gonna remember. I don't know I'll, even if Sylvia remembers that. Do you remember dress codes too? Oh. Where we had dress I Tell think me. the dress code ended well, <laughs> eighth grade year. Because remember the clothes our hair are crazy, man. Our hair couldn't touch our collars. Yeah. And our shirts had to be buttoned all the way to the top. Really? And I remember when I remember girls that. could wear slacks, slacks one day. 
and we could wear jeans one day. It was like Fridays were jeans and wow. slack days. Wow, I don't remember that. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it took But place. I think it was in eighth grade when they finally said Stop public that. school kids don't have to have a dress code. Yeah. And then all broke loose. We wore... <laughs> <laughs> Blue jeans Man, and remember the colors? Boots yeah, and yeah, it was t-shirts. crazy. Platform shoes. Uh, the the whole uh, Eastview vibe was really cool because, like I said, we came in as seventh graders. We went to eighth grade, and then the new seventh graders came in. So yeah. now our school had two grades, and uh, that was cool. And I think uh, there, I'm still gonna say there wasn't a lot of you know your little kids were gonna push you around. It probably happened, but man, I never saw it. And finally, we get. We became a full school with three grades, uh, seven, eight, nine in it, and uh, you know you could you could see and feel the tightness of that school, and, and uh, we had some a lot of young teachers that had just come out of college, and then we had a lot of uh, seasoned teachers. We had a few seasoned teachers, they were who, young teachers, but the young teachers, yeah. and some of them were just not equipped <laughs> for um, us. Yeah, and I. Feel to this day, I feel horrible for some of the stuff we did, Mister. Yeah, uh, I tortured that for a teacher. Did you, well, Mister? Did yeah. you ever have him? He was, I did. He had the hearing aids. I did. Yes. And I used to sit with my and just tap my pencil, and he'd be. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, he'd call on me, and I'd go. But one day he got mad at me, and I, it was one of those bad dressing days where oh. I had an sh- unbuttoned shirt like that with a scarf. Yeah, oh, I had a scarf on. And he yeah. he had a little office outside his room where yeah. you had to go sit if you were bad. And he grabbed me around the throat and shoved me right into the wall. I had my scarf and everything. That's history, man. He goes, the next time you cause any problems, Mr. Palladino, you will be expelled from my class. From that time on, I never messed with Mr. Hendry. I always yeah. made him mad. And I made um, my speech teacher. He's the one I'm thinking of. And he always used to get mad and frustrated at me. You have so much, much talent, talent potential. potential. You all do. And all you do is screw around. around. <laughs> it's like, but he, and it was a great I guy. He bad. just did not have the, 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 the tools to, for classroom management. But he had he had those tools, he it would have served him well. He was very expressive. Yes. And expressive wasn't... In those days, it was it was yeah. offbeat. He was yeah. almost like a hippie. Yeah, yeah. And Mrs. Thomas, my English teacher, oh, God her. love her. I liked her. She always, she used to look at me at sad eyes, yeah. just wasting your potential. Yeah. She even signed that in my yearbook. If you ever learn to shut your mouth, <laughs> you could be. And I feel bad. There's so. <laughs> if you know, you'd ever learn to shut your, your mouth, mouth, you've got so much, Joe. Yeah. You're disrupting the class. Go, God. go down to Mr. Graham's office. And Mr. Graham would always be, what you do now, Joe? Right, right. Mrs. Thomas got me. I remember when we had our, oh, did yeah. you come to our Eastview reunion? I did, yeah. Mrs. Thomas was there. Yeah. I apologized to her. Yeah. She goes, first of all, you don't have to call me Mrs. Thomas anymore, Joe. My name is Kathy. Uh-huh. I'm like, you're always going to be Mrs. Thomas. <laughs> My uh, son was playing basketball for Eastview. Okay. And uh, after the game, my son goes, Dad, the... The uh, Kimball coach asked me if Joe Palladino was my father, and I said, yeah. And I look, and here comes Mac, strutting across. Same one, go, same Mr. Walk. McAteer. Yeah. He goes, Joe, it's, call me Jim. Yeah. He, he goes, that your boy? I go, yeah. He goes, you got a lot more talent than you ever had. I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> and he was telling me at the time he was getting ready to retire. And How about like, that? Retire, Isn't that only, something? He goes, well, I'm 55. He goes, Joe, when I taught you guys, I was 22, 23. That's right. Him and Mr. Mackey. Mr. Mackey, blonde hair, yeah. Mrs. Stewart. Yeah. Wow. All those teachers, Mrs. Seymour. Yeah, these were very young, they were right out of college. Right people. out of college. Then and we never realized how yeah. um young they were. Yeah. Because you know, we were still young. Yeah. But here listen to Mackey, I'm retiring, I'm fifty three. And I'm like, Wow. Before one of my Biggest disappointments at junior high. Yeah. Remember how we said we used to play football? Yeah, at Teft? right, right, yeah. I remember I was always a good running back. And Koza uh-huh. would say, you know, next year, Palladino. Now, Koza, when you say that, he was the co- the head coach yeah, that later did football coach. head football, head basketball. Palladino, you're going to be my fullback when we get when we start football next year. You're going to be my fullback. So when football started. Well, you started, take it with you. Well, I, when football started, I was the starting fullback. But I could never hit the hole running full speed. 
bless it, Pelo Nino, you can't get to the hole fast enough. And I tried. I tried for the two weeks in practice. And I remember a week before yeah. the first game, yeah. he called me in the office. He goes, you're going to right guard. I'm going to put Al Pondell at fullback. First of all, I always had a competition with Al. Right. We yeah. played baseball against him all through. It was always uh, El Pondell, Joe Pellinino, Pellinino, Pondell. We're always got mm-hmm. mixed up. Yeah. I still run into people and say, hey, El, how you doing? No, oh, I'm no. Joe. Yeah. That was El. Yeah. But anyway, and then it kind of changed the course. El went on to be a star running back in high school. Yeah. And and I was a lineman until Taboda, for some reason, yeah. picked me out and said, hey, you're going to be the B-team quarterback. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Those were quality years. I mean, character building years. I'll tell you the thing I think in my life that uh, built my character, helped build my character uh, more and more. Sports, definitely. Yeah, sports. Music, too. I was oh. in music as well. There were things that I, I had to uh, do in music that uh, broke new ground for me. It helped me immensely. But same thing for sports, though, because if you did not do what your assignment was in sports, it did hurt the entire team. Exactly. And uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you about one play in football. One play in football. <laughs> it's, I've got it memorized. I can see the whole thing. We're playing Ellis. It's the last game of the season. I think we're going to win. I think we were ahead quite a bit. Yeah. And um, I had – there was this great uh, play that our coach, Coach Coza, had um, – uh, developed the triple option. Remember, triple uh, option triple left, option, yep. triple, op- triple option right. And he's a, here's a guy who probably wanted to be a higher level coach, and he did become he that. Did he in, did in Colorado. become that. Yep. Uh, but he finally had a team that he could pull some plays out, and there were the people people who were intelligent enough to be able to. You could pull a tackle, have him run all the way to the other side, and take out the uh, middle linebacker. Pull the tackle. Pull yeah. the tackle. Well, Who you, was doing you that? You were quick enough to do that. Well, though. well, <laughs> it went right to, right side and left side. Uh, oh, the uh, the middle linebacker for Ellis. Uh, Ledbetter. Ledbetter. Yeah, Wait, man. Ledbetter. I went. I pulled and I went around and I see Ledbetter coming, watching the play, and he's running full speed after me, and I blocked him, threw a block right at him. <laughs> And I never remember anything hurting as much. <laughs> and I can remember like a year later, we're all playing football together at the high school level. And I'm telling him that story. And he just looks at me and goes, yeah, of course it hurt. It was me. <laughs> now, I add a couple curse words in there and you, he, you've got he never pretty close. confidence. No, he didn't. He should have kept playing. Awesome. You know, it's it, it's it's uh, it was a good group of people. It's not bad for us to have memories and talk about them. No, nope, not at all. Maybe to me and you, it's fun. Well, it's very therapeutic because uh, to me, because it was a good time. I mean, boy, I I couldn't have told you I was having a good time while I was there because I <laughs> I think I was always like, oh boy, is this right? Is this right? Is this this look right? But everybody was going through the same thing. Like I told you too, when my first granddaughter was born, I just started writing a book about myself. Did you? This is, I wanted Maddie to know what her grandfather was like. Yeah. And, um, you know, because I know when they get out in school, they always want to know about their family history. Yeah. So I wanted to put something together for all my grandkids, you know. Hey, my grand, my dad was, my grandfather was born in Chicago. He moved to Hanover Park when he was three. Yeah. This was his friends on Sycamore. He went to Eastview and everything. You know what, Paul? We're pretty lucky. Okay. Our generation is the last I, I i hate to say it we're the last great generation we're the last generation that used the rotary phone you mm-hmm. know we're the last generation Type that letter. did things without computers we went outside and played we didn't yeah. have video games right we listened to music like you say you can hear a song and it takes you back to hey i was dating peggy when this song was mm-hmm. or i was hanging out with my friends at issue when this song was popular or i heard mm-hmm. this song yeah. at the roller rink yeah right right we're lucky yes I, I knock on wood that I'm hoping I still have another 20 or 30 years yeah. on this earth. And, you know, we're lucky. We we lived, our kids will say it was a simple time, but it was a simple time. Yeah, it was a simple time. We didn't think it was. Well, I feel very blessed in life. I have four wonderful children. Yeah. I have a great girlfriend. Mm-hmm. She has yeah. great children mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, her grandchild. I have been blessed all through life to make friends at every part of my life. Well, Joe, it's been a 
pleasure having you here oh. today, and thank you. Best of luck to you. Oh, thank you, sir. Good night. Very aware of his legacy, Joe is confident and strong in his verbal communication with his friends and family. When I asked Joe about doing this podcast, he responded by saying, I'm not sure I have anything anyone would want to hear, but I can tell you this, I sure am lucky. To me, Joe's confidence and bravado is his gift to share. And after one conversation with Joe recently, I had the urge to complete business with a couple of those hard to please clients. We never know how we might affect another person. Skilled and gifted, Joe interacts daily with people, family, customers, and friends. And you don't have to look too awfully close to realize we are all better for it. For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Our show is put together by producer Paul Hart with assistance by Heidi Cerner, Charlie Valere, and S.T. Dog. Mixed by Chad Loebner, technical director Heidi Cerner. Musical assistance by Riley Hart. Special thanks on today's show to Joe Palladino and Cindy Chase Sarnowski. Our website, sixtoadcinema.vistaprintdigital.com. I'm Paul Hart, and stay tuned for more stories from Life's Learning Curve. We're clear. <laughs>